Hi everybody, uh, my name is Dave Aronian and uh, my goal here today is to run you through the process of taking high quality photographs of your artwork. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, give a quick demo of how to do this and I'm going to explain the lighting that we need to use, a little bit about the camera, how to figure out your exposure for the photographs and, um, and just the general process for getting a, a good quality photograph. But the intent here is to get a, a, a high quality image for you to use that can be used for a multitude of different purposes. You're going to want to use a decent quality digital camera for this. Uh, the camera I'm using is a, is a Fuji digital camera that's 24 megapixels. That's probably more than you need, but you want to use at least probably 16 megapixels if you want to make a decent sized print. Um, so uh, a small point and shoot style digital camera is not going to be uh, workable for this sort of thing. A couple things you'll need. You will need a tripod to put the camera on because you want the camera to be relatively square to the pieces. So hand holding it's not going to work. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, you're going to want obviously a couple of lights, which I'll, which I'll run through, and, a, and enough space to work in, given that generally the maximum size of the piece you want, you want to have enough room on it that you can set up two lights like we have here, uh, spaced far enough away that you can get them at about a 45 degree angle to the piece you're photographing. The reason we want the 45 degree angle, if you're photographing something that has glass on it, or perhaps uh, um, a piece done with oils that has some reflection or glare to it, uh, the lights can pick that up. And by having them at a 45 degree angle, you eliminate pretty much most of the glare. So you want to have enough space to set the lights up. The lights that we're using here are essentially uh, what's called um, hot lights or tungsten lights. These are, these are low tech and they're essentially, um, they're running a standard household incandescent light bulb. Um, uh, you can also put LED bulbs in these, but it'll work just, just the same way as well. Um, uh, and the good thing about them is, is essentially they're on um, as you see them, so what you see is what you get, and it makes it very easy to work with. Uh, a couple things to keep, keep aware of is make sure, um, you're gonna want the lights to be the same distance from the subject, and you're going to want to make sure you have the same kind of bulbs in the lamps because that will affect the exposure and the color of the light, which I'll explain. So because we're using two lights, you want the light source to be even on the, on the subject you're taking the photograph of. There's a couple ways you can make sure of that. One is that I can use a photographic light meter and I can quite literally measure the light um, at the subject of each light. I would block this light, so I'm only picking up the one and take a reading. And I do this thing in the other way, and, and my meter will tell me what, how much light they're putting out, and I can tell if it's even or not. If it's not, I'll want to move the lights either closer or further away until they are even. Um, you can eyeball that pretty, pretty easily, like the setup we have here. If you don't have a light meter, the other really quick and dirty way of doing it is this. This is a piece of tape, and I've literally folded it in the middle to make it three-dimensional, and I've stuck it on the wall. And all you need to do is set the lights up as evenly as possible and look at that and look at the shadow it's putting out. And that little piece will create a shadow and the shadow should be equal on both sides. Pretty simple. So it's not, uh, not too complicated to figure out. Um, and I can just, I can even, I'll, I can leave that on the wall because it's not going to be in the way of our shot. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to make sure the, light, the lighting is even. Once you've got that done, the next thing you want to make sure you're aware of is the actual color of the light. And when I talk about color of light, um, uh, incandescent bulbs like this and LED bulbs, any light bulbs, uh, have a color temperature associated with them. And because we're photographing uh, pieces that we want to, to show um, realistically as they actually are, you want to make sure the color temperature is accurate. So in this space here, this wall is white, which is great. The white gives us a reference that we can use in the camera. And Again, if you wanted to get really fancy about it, you could take your photograph in your camera shooting a raw image and you could set the light or the color temperature in Photoshop afterwards. My goal here is to do this simply so you don't have to use Photoshop. And luckily, all digital cameras that are of a good quality, so not a point and shoot type of camera, um, allows you to set the color temperature in the camera. So if we look at the back of my camera here as it's set up, So right now we're looking at the back of my camera and you can see by looking at this picture 
there's probably a slight color cast on it, looking a little bit yellowish. Now that's because these incandes incandescent bulbs have a color cast associated with them. What you want to do is, is adjust the light, the color temperature of these lights to ensure that the wall is actually white. And when you do that, then you have a more accurate uh, color representation. All cameras are different in how their you know, settings are. On my camera, it's pretty easy. Um, I can go into the menu in the back and I've got an option for white balance. And then one of the other options in here, amongst a few other different settings, is this setting here, which allows me to, oops, there we go. This allows me to adjust the temperature. Um, and color temperature is measured in degrees Kelvin. Right now it's set at 5600 degrees K. That is typical daylight, which works great if you're shooting outside on a nice sunny day, but we're not. We're inside using these weird light bulbs. So, by, by adjusting the temperature down, you can see the color temperature change on the screen. And I've taken it down to, this setting is, is 2850K. Now I'm just eyeballing it here, but that looks pretty, pretty close to me. That's going to give me a much closer representation of what the color actually is. And to be honest, you might have to do some fine-tuning, a little bit of uh, trial and error to, make, to get it exactly perfect. Um, but that's, that's the way you do that. A any digital camera that's of decent quality will allow you to set the color temperature. And that's going to be very important. So now that we've got our color temperature set, we're basically ready to take our photograph. We've got the lighting equal on both sides. You've got a more accurate color temperature set in the camera. To set up the camera itself, the ideal scenario, let's say we're photographed, well, we've got a piece on the wall here which isn't, isn't strictly two-dimensional, it's actually got some depth to it. The ideal scenario is to set the camera up so that it's at the same height as the piece you're photographing. That way you don't have the problem of parallel lines or an exaggeration of, of, um, uh, of, of the angle of the, photo, of the piece you're photographing. So ideally, the camera's at the same height as the piece, and I should have mentioned also that the lights should be pretty much equal to the height or the center of the object you're photographing as well, just to keep it all in the center. Now, normally, I would probably, ideally, I would move the camera in tighter so that the subject fills the frame as much as possible. That way we have minimal cropping. Just for our, our sample purposes, I'll leave the camera set here. Um, you can always expect to do a little bit of cropping around the image if, if, if you need to. But essentially, we're done right here. I should mention that the settings in the camera, I use manual settings. And I've got, a, I've got a, an aperture of 5.6 and a shutter speed of a 30th of a second. Slow shutter speed is fine because it's on a tripod, and that's another reason to use a tripod. Um, and the aperture is important because you want to have enough focus or depth of field to cover the depth of the piece you're photographing. In this case, I know 5.6 is going to give me plenty of depth of field for a, a relatively shallow piece like that, or, or a, a painting as well that's more two-dimensional, not an issue at all. But you, you don't want to photograph at a number of, for example, 2 or 2.8. Um, you might have some focus issues. So, we've got the camera set up, the exposure is where we want it, and we've taken our photograph. Um, some people might like to do what's called bracketing, which means you take a couple pictures of the same thing and you can actually change the shutter speed a little bit faster and slower to have a, a slightly brighter and darker image just to, to make sure you've got it. Um, and you might have to do some editing afterwards if you choose. But really, I can tell looking at this, we've got a, a perfect photograph right there. So there you go. This is a, like I said, it's a slightly um, more than two dimensional uh, piece. It's got a slight curvature to it and you can't really tell, but there's a little bit of glare on the side of it, which doesn't present a problem uh, uh, to me, and hopefully not to the artist. The nice thing about it is that it actually gives depth to the picture. It shows the depth to the piece itself, so it's not just static. So this next piece we've got here is, um, is a painting, a watercolor, with glass over it. The glass can present a real problem because of the glare you get from the glass. What can happen is if you're at an angle, which you can hopefully see right now, um, you can probably see a reflection of the other light in the glass. 
That's the reason for the 45 degree angle. If you shift back over towards where the camera is, there's no reflection whatsoever and the piece has a really nice even light on it and you can get a nice high quality photograph even through the glass. So you don't necessarily have to remove your pieces from glass as long as they're lit in a way that doesn't have any glare, which again is pretty straightforward when you can have a setup like this. Okay, so for our, our last setup here, I wanted to show you um, the, kind of the general idea for photographing a three-dimensional object that's on a, on a flat surface like this. So here we have our lovely duck, um, and the previous lighting setup we had uh, is not ideal for that because those two lights were set up in such a way that they're shining directly on the object, which, ha which is a harsher light, and it also creates shadows in behind it. So what we've done here is what I like to call um, creating a softer light for the, sub for the subject. And that's done by taking the same lights we have and flipping them around and actually bouncing them off of a large white card. And uh, you can use, um, these, these cards aren't that large. Um, at a place like uh, Opus here in Victoria, you can, you can buy sheets of foam core, which are ideal. Uh, in fact, that's a small sheet of foam core right there. Um, nice white surface to bounce the light off of. And the result of that is that there is a little bit of a shadow coming off this, but you can see it's a very soft shadow. And, and this can be adjusted too. You can bring the lights in closer. You can, if you want, you can back one light off so it's brighter on one side than the other. If, if you want, you can do all kinds of little adjustments. But I strongly recommend an approach like this where you're bouncing the light off of a large white card because it creates nice softer light um, that's just more appealing and it sh to, to show the subject. Um, so what we'll do here is, the other thing I'll mention is that right now this looks a little bit dark probably because uh, uh, the amount of light coming off this is, is reduced because we're bouncing it, it's not direct. Don't worry about it, in the camera um, I've got the exposure set so this, this looks uh, quite bright and you, may, you might even want to see that if, if you want. This shot obviously um, we could finesse this more. Uh, if you don't want a seam in the background, you can actually use a piece of paper. You get a piece of white paper. Um, uh, cardstock actually works really nicely, or um, Bristol board, and stuff it up on the table with a curve, and then you don't have a seam in behind it. Mm -hmm. Nice and easy to do. Um, but in this, in this setup here, we've actually slowed the camera way down, so my shutter speed is down to um, a quarter of a second at f5.6. Uh, so that's a, it's, a, it's a slow shutter speed, and in fact, if we're going to do this properly, you should use a cable release for that slow of a shutter speed, just to make sure there's no shake in the camera, which is highly unlikely, but just in case. And so there we have the photograph. Okay. Okay, so those are our basic setups for, for doing uh, copy work. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention, uh, I mentioned it briefly at the start, is the idea of uh, the camera that you're using, again, should be a decent quality camera, one that you can set color temperature in, ideally shoot manually, so you can control all the settings, the shutter speed and the aperture. And what I've done here is I'm shooting in JPEG mode, which is sort of the standard shooting mode, um, which is perfectly fine for this application. As long as you can adjust the color temperature, you don't need to shoot a raw file because that creates another layer of complexity, which means you need to use Photoshop or another program to process the raw files. But you can do that if you really want to dial in the color temperature absolutely precisely, but it's really not that necessary to do. Um, using the methods we've run through here, again, you might have to do some trial and error with your color temperature settings in the camera uh, to get it absolutely accurate. Um, but you'll get extremely close. In fact, you can get, um, you can get it perfectly accurate that way. Uh, so you don't, need to, you don't need to be shooting raw files for this, um, unless you really want to. Uh, and I think we've covered off everything you need to do. So thank you very much. <laughs>